Hi, church family. Happy Sabbath to each one of you. We are here in the Fellowship Hall where registration for VBS took place. That is why I am in this t-shirt. It's the volunteer t-shirt. This is some of the uh, decorations that Shauna and her team put together, which was absolutely amazing. It was so fun to see all of the families and the kids back on campus just enjoying their time together. And it did rain. One <laughs> one right. day, but it, all all is well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here in Southern California, we're not quite used to that. And by the way, Pastor Shauna in coming weeks is going to give a whole video report. But it was great to see the families, the kids in the amphitheater here in the Fellowship Hall. Our new building, Mission Building, is being used in a wonderful way. A couple of announcements. It's really also with the in person with Vacation Bible School, though limited. It was still incredible. Another thing that's great is we're gonna be celebrating communion today in person, which we haven't done for a long time. That's pretty great. Also, we've been announcing for a while the quilting ministry. Well, that is tomorrow at 9 a.m. If you're interested in, in that, it's, there's still time. Go to our website and you can find out information. And just a reminder, you don't have to have experience. They're happy to train you. The Land of the Bible Tour that we have mentioned before, registration for that closes July the 5th. We really recommend and encourage you to, if you can, to sign up for this. It will change your whole life as far as reading the Bible and just, you actually get visuals and, and um, the smells, everything just comes to life when you read the Bible stories uh, again. So if you would like to go, remember registration closes July the 5th and you can register online. And then finally, we just want to let you know that we do have podcasts of the sermon, uh, Sabbath School and Praxis Night Church. You can go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else that you go to get your podcast. If you haven't listened, listen, you should check it out. It's, it's just a great thing. Whether you're exercising or just kind of chilling, you put it on and listen to some great stuff. Well, I think that's all that we have for announcements today. If you want any more information, please check out our website. There are lots of details there. Remember that we really do love each and every one of you, and we hope that you have a blessed Sabbath day.
Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Whether you're joining us online or you're here in person, we are so glad that you decided to participate in worship. Today marks another milestone in our transition back from the pandemic, because today we celebrate our first in-person communion in, a, in about 18 months. Amen. And just to give you an idea of how long it's been, the last time we celebrated communion here in the sanctuary together, uh, Soup Plantation was still open. <laughs> Anybody sad about that? Yeah. Zoom was something that only race cars did. And, and um, social distancing was just kind of like a really bad form of bullying. So a lot has changed in the past year and a half. But one thing that hasn't changed is that we still gather together at the table to celebrate communion. We still practice this tradition that was central to the life of the early church. Because communion is about more than just little bits of bread and, and juice. It's about the sacrifice that Jesus made and the hope that he provides that makes this community possible. So as we enter into worship, I invite you to remember that community is at the heart of communion. Welcome to communion. Welcome to worship. Please stand as we sing our hymn of praise together. And so God calls us throughout eternity to love and adore. I know that you are on pins and needles wondering if our mics are going to work. You can relax as I invite you to standing. Close your eyes, bow your heads, open your hearts as we speak to our Creator. Love, love throughout eternity. Love is the language, God, that pushes us to adore you. And today, Father, we feel loved. The question then becomes, how do we replicate that love in other people's lives? God, the early church answered that question with a table. And today we gather at a table to celebrate, to celebrate what you have done for us and to revel in the promise of what you will do through us. Lord, we come together recognizing that just as in every family, our table is punctuated by issues. We come to it and as we sit, we carry baggage. There are wounds that are continuing to cause discomfort even as we prepare to partake of this meal. 
And so we would plead with you, O Lord, that you grant us the capacity to trust in you enough so that we may today leave our burdens and our baggage at your feet. We come to this table and we recognize that there are empty place, places at our meal. We know that there are people, Lord, who are bedridden, who are homebound, who are watching us from a hospital bed. Lord, may the communal experience of eating and drinking together travel beyond space so that those people that are experiencing this service outside of the confines of this church may feel you in a new way, may feel you in a powerful way. Even more, Lord, we know that there are places at our table that will never be filled. We've lost loved ones and family members and our hearts continue to yearn, we continue to miss, and so at the table, we do this in remembrance of you, for you have promised that your body was broken so that our hearts might be bound up, that your blood was shed so that we may be able to wipe away our tears. And so we come to this table we come to this table grasping onto the promise of a better tomorrow and clasping in our hands the ideal of unity and community that is forged as we eat. And so, Father, we would pray that you bless our meal and that you continue manifesting yourself through our community, for we pray in your name. And all the people of God said, amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. We have yet more reasons to celebrate this morning. Not only are we all gathered together in person, but we are celebrating uh, four baptisms between the first service and second service. I am joined by my dear friend, Gianna Nation. Gianna is an amazing young woman. She has decided to make church a high priority and she she takes that from uh, the priority that her family has set on church. Jared and Jennifer are her parents, and she's the granddaughter of our dear beloved Will Nation. And we are so excited about her testimony today. She uh, is not afraid to stand up and declare her love for Jesus Christ, and that's what she's doing today, but she's done that often in the junior high room. She's a junior high leader, always willing to help, and we try to get these young people involved in their church right away. Amen? And so you see junior high today in lots of places. You see our youth, uh, our kids from the youth department, lots of places, our young adult and our children from all the generational pastors, including our senior adults. It's an amazing experience to be a part of a church that's so active. Gianna is one of the most active, always willing to come early, to stay late. She studied at home during, uh, nation, uh, during uh, COVID, and she didn't like it. So she's going to go to the academy next year. She's in eighth grade, and we're very excited about that. Uh, it's a joy to have uh, her whole family uh, attend so regularly. She is a wonderful model. And Gianna wants the world to know that she will follow Jesus the rest of her life. Yeah, just like that. There you go. So, Gianna, it's a joy to have you in our youth room. Oh, and we want your family to stand. <laughs> I almost forgot. Thank you. Stand up. Uh, if you're a family or if you're friends of Gianna, this is the second time I've done that in one day. Oh, look at that. That's awesome. So many people that care about you. You may be seated. I've got, the, uh, I've got the brass telling me that I'm forgetting something now, so that's really good. They're on, I'm on their radar. But you love the Lord, Gianna, and I love that. We ask uh, that, that you will continue that wonderful testimony because there's a lot of young people here watching your uh, testimony today. 
And it gives me great joy to now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may have heard her gasping a little bit because the water is especially chilly this morning, which is wonderful. Don't change a thing. It just makes me want to praise the Lord. Perhaps you, too, want to pursue baptism in your life. Perhaps you want to respond to the Holy Spirit in, on your heart. If you want to be baptized, friends, please let one of the pastors know or one of the elders know, and we would love to journey with you on that walk. not me. <laughs> I think God's calling. <laughs> Collect. <laughs> and uh, because of your generosity, maybe we can help Doug remember. Uh, <laughs> uh, wasn't that great? Another baptism. Um, it's so good to see you out here. And I just want to say thank you for your generosity. Your generosity has helped so many things just this week. It felt like some of our Texans out there brought their Texas weather. We had lightning and thunderstorms, but VBS still took place. So you've seen the kids, all the decorations they did. They had to take it up, put it down, put it back up. It was just great. Our junior high, our praxis. And a few weeks ago, the pastors spent some time kind of visioning for the new year. And it's, such, it's so rewarding to be part of this church, the visioning in terms of how we can minister even better, especially being a university church. We're trying to do a better job of reaching out to actually the university, the students. You should see the cafe, Linda Mendez and her team. There are university students all over the place, meeting there, eating there. Um, it is just so, so wonderful. And as you know, also, after a baptism, that's not it. There's a whole life after that. And so we're trying to be so much more intentional to make sure this is a community for each one of you that you feel the sense of transformation and a growing closer to each other and to God. And because of your generosity, that's being, po that's being made possible. Now, like what we always like to say is we want you just to be able to worship. But if you're in a position where you can continue to support this ministry, we're making good progress on the building and other ministries, church budget. Um, if you're in a position to do that, we would appreciate it. But once again, thank you so much for your generosity.
Isn't that beautiful? Isn't it wonderful to be back together? It's a thrill to worship God with you face to face. The truth is we live in a difficult time. When you drove away from the office yesterday, you probably left colleagues behind who feel isolated and cut off from others. When you pulled out of the driveway on your way here this morning, there were probably people and houses, maybe very nice houses near yours, who feel like they're all alone in the world. You may have slipped into the pew this morning and sat beside somebody without even knowing it, who feels broken, has blown it, and doesn't have any place to turn to feel connected. The truth is, we're fractured. Now, COVID has a lot to do with that. It fractured our world into millions, hundreds of millions, little of pods all over the world of people feeling alone. So it had a lot to do with it. But by far, it is not the only thing. There are many real, other realities that separate us. We're different from other people. We feel different. We feel like we've never been invited into a circle of trust. Or we feel like we've messed up, we've blown it, and we really don't deserve to be with good people. When I was in the fifth grade, our family moved back to Texas from Latin America for a couple of years. It was in the fall of the year and school was starting, and in Texas in the fall, football is king. And so when we had recess time, everybody raced out to the recess grounds and the boys all began to play football. Well, I had played a little bit of backyard catch with my dad and my brother, but I had never played anything organized, and so what I saw unfolding before me was chaotic. I would later in life come to understand the reason George Will said football com combines the two worst aspects of American life, violence and committee meetings. <laughs> and so I watched these guys gather in committee meetings, and then they'd go out and face each other, and there was mayhem for a few seconds, and they were back to the committee meeting and didn't know what was going on. I didn't get chosen. But then came P.E. time, and at P.E. time, everybody had to play, no option. So even I had to be on a team. So sure enough, they chose me on a team, and I'm sure the captain chose me with great reluctance. His name was, well, I'll call him Steve, <laughs> since that was his name. Um, <laughs> Steve was a jock. He was in control. He ran everything, and everybody knew it. He was our quarterback. In the huddle, he would tell us what to do, and I wasn't part of it until the moment one day when he said, okay, Roberts, you're my halfback. I'm going to get the ball. I'm going to hand it to you, and then you follow me around the end. You got that? I think so. <laughs> and don't drop it. I really wish he hadn't said that because then maybe I wouldn't have been thinking that as much. We got up to the line. He called the signals. The ball was high. He handed it to me. I dropped it. The play was over. It went like clockwork, just straight through. And then he stood there and yelled at me. What is wrong with you? I put it right in your bread basket. Can't you hold on to anything? We had come back from other countries to a world where I felt very isolated already. But as a fifth grader, I can remember being on that field and feeling like I was on an island all by myself. And it was painful. There are a lot of people around us. There are people among us who feel that. So we go back to Project 242, Acts, the second chapter, beginning with verse 42. Last week, Pastor Miguel began us in a powerful way, talking about the necessity, the essential reality that if we are to be a healthy body, there must be conversation. And, and his live-out challenge was talk to somebody, listen to them, take, take notes of what you learned, send it into us. Many of you responded. Very simple to do. Website, Live Out Challenge, let us know, because we have another Live Out Challenge for you today. So we go to Acts, the second chapter. Acts chapter 2, we're going to begin reading in verse 42. But before we read, let me ask you to watch for something. Watch in this rather short paragraph for the references to eating, to the table. 
There are three of them. So let's read Acts 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Verse 42, the breaking of bread. Verse 46, they broke bread together in homes. Verse 46, ate together with glad and sincere heart. There was a lot of eating going on in the early church, just in case you were wondering. Because it's not just here in Acts. Dr. Luke also wrote the Gospel of Luke. That's why you'll hear scholars often refer to Luke-Acts because the same writer wrote them both. So with that in mind, listen to these words taken from New Testament, a New Testament scholar named Grant Osborne. Brief, brief statement, but it's worth noting. He says, an amazing number of scenes in the Gospel of Luke were over meals. And this continued in the early church. Meals provided the core theme of fellowship, then spread to include every area of life. How do I summarize that? The table was central to the early church. Why was it so important? Was it just that they were hungry? Certainly that could be part of it. But it was important for another reason, another brief one-line quote from a different New Testament scholar, Craig Keener, who says, table fellowship denoted intimacy and trust. Table fellowship denoted intimacy and trust. So they gathered around the table to eat. In fact, scholars, as they look at this paragraph in Acts, say certainly the wording in the original speaks of just eating a meal, probably a common meal, but it speaks to more than that. It probably was a context and a situation where they sat down, they ate the meal together, and then at the end of the meal, they participated in the Lord's Supper so that you had both things unfolding. Now, if you've spent any time in Acts, you may have wondered, how in the world did this small cadre of untrained, unlearned disciples make such a difference that one of their foes would later say, you've turned the world upside down? How did they do that? Well, obviously, they did it through the power of the Holy Spirit that is preeminent and first. But the Holy Spirit used certain mechanisms to accomplish that. The table was a key mechanism. I want to read a quote to you. It's a, it's a, it'll take us a couple of moments. It's not short. It's one that this week when I was rereading it, having shared it in other situations, I thought, you know, we probably ought to read this at least at once a year, or at least at every communion service. It's from the pen of Max Lucado, the writer and preacher. And he's talking about the central reality of the table in the early church. As I read, notice the similarities the early church faced to the world of our day, and notice how they overcame those. So here are Lucado's words. Long before the church had pulpits and baptistries, she had kitchens and dinner tables. Even a casual reading of the New Testament unveils the house as the primary tool of the church. The primary gathering place of the church was the home. Consider the genius of God's plan. The first generation of Christians was a tinderbox of contrasting cultures and backgrounds. At least 15 different nationalities heard Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. Jews stood next to Gentiles. Men worshiped with women. Slaves and masters alike sought after Christ. Can people of such varied backgrounds and cultures get along with each other? We wonder the same thing today. Can Hispanics live in peace with Anglos? Can Democrats find common ground with Republicans? Can a Christian family carry on a civil friendship with a Muslim couple down the street? Can divergent people get along? 
The early church did. Without the aid of sanctuaries, church buildings, clergy, or seminaries, they did so through the clearest of messages, the cross, and the simplest of tools, the home. Not everyone can serve in a foreign land, lead a relief effort, or volunteer at, a downtown soup, at the downtown soup kitchen. But who can't be hospitable? Do you have a front door, a table, chairs, bread and meat for sandwiches? Congratulations. You just qualified to serve in the most ancient of ministries, hospitality. Something holy happens around the dinner table that can never happen in, the sa in a sanctuary. In a church auditorium, you see the backs of heads. Around the table, you see the expressions on faces. In the auditorium, one person speaks. Around the table, everyone has a voice. Church services are on the clock. Around the table, there is time to talk. Hospitality opens the door to uncommon community. It's no accident that hospital and hospitality come from the same Latin word, for they both lead to the same result, healing. When you open your door to someone, you are sending this message. You matter to me and to God. You may think you are saying, come over for a visit, but what your guest hears is you're worth the effort. Hospitality, the table. You see, when we come to the supper table of the Lord, our focus is typically and correctly on the vertical nature of what happens at this table, the symbolism it has for saying that God bridged the gulf between God's self and humanity to bring us together into one, to reconcile us. That's what we remember here at the table. But what we too easily overlook is there's not just a vertical nature, there's a horizontal nature. It brings us together as sister and brother in Christ. It connects us. The table. It's what the early church did. They broke bread. They ate together. Now, I'll tell you very frankly, as I've thought about this, as I've worked on this this week, as I've prayed on this this week, thinking about the Live Out Challenge, it is cut directly across the grain of my heart because I don't do this easily. My wife will tell my, my wife would just say, y'all come on over for lunch, and you'd all show up. And I'd be at home thinking, what, what, what did you do? <laughs> you invited all of them? Oh, my goodness. I mean, I, <laughs> this nice couple right over here, my colleague, the church business administrator, Tim Ross and his wife, and their family. We were hanging out one evening, hanging out, having a good time. Must have been a Saturday night. I don't remember. At a restaurant. Having, and as, as it came time to leave, my wife says to them and to everyone else who's there, y'all come on over. We'll, we'll, we'll continue the party at our house. I kicked my wife under the table. <laughs> Except I missed her and kicked Kim. <laughs> And Kim looked at me and said, you don't want us coming over, do you? I was like, oh, my goodness. Well, that somehow coincided not too long after that with something I was preaching on about hospitality, and it led to the learning of a deep lesson in my own heart and life. I haven't perfectly learned it, please, but I am definitely learning it, and that is simply this. Your ability to be hospitable does not have to do with the size of your home. It has to do with the size of your heart. The size of your heart is what invites people to the table, people who are different from you, people who are ones that you would not naturally gravitate toward. That's what the early church did. And that's what this symbolizes. Yes, it symbolizes the sacrifice of Jesus, the vertical nature, but Jesus never separates himself from the horizontal nature, how it affects others around us. Now, if you're anything like me, you're sitting there thinking, Randy, you're saying that the world was changed, that our world could be changed in so many ways by this? Come on. It's a thimble full of juice. It's a tiny, unleavened wafer. How can that have power to change the world? It's what it symbolizes. And symbols are powerful. 
Just think of some symbols, some of them dramatically different, some of them eliciting dramatically different responses, but bound together by the power they hold. One person salutes. Another person puts hand over heart. Another person raises a fist into the air. Another takes a knee on a field. And the world erupts because of the power of symbols. This is a symbol of something of great power. Gary Thomas, in Christianity Today, now some years ago, wrote of the visit of then Vice President George H.W. Bush to the Soviet Union to attend the funeral service for the fallen premier Leonid Brezhnev. Bush saw something at that service that probably many others did not see. It came toward the very end of the service. In fact, it was that moment when they were going to lower the lid of the casket for the last time. The armed guards were there. They, they were already grasping the lid to lower it when the widow of Brezhnev stepped up to the casket and reached into it. Not everybody could see. But what she did was to place her finger on her husband's chest and draw the sign of the cross. Symbol. Gary Thomas, writing of that, says, There, in the citadel of secular atheistic power, the wife of the man who had run it all hoped that her husband was wrong. She hoped that there was another life and that that life was best represented by Jesus who died on the cross and that the same Jesus might yet have mercy on her husband. A symbol. Power. Or ask the late John McCain. In the 2008 presidential primary, a writer from Time magazine asked McCain about his personal journey of faith. And McCain responded by telling a story, an incident of, of what happened in a period of time when he was imprisoned as a prisoner of war in Vietnam. He said there was a period of time when they were tying me up at night, when they tied my hands behind my back and ran the rope up around my neck and down to my knees and yanked my knees up and my head down till my head was crammed between my knees and then they would tie it tight and there they would leave me cast on the floor of that cell all night long. Excruciating pain. One night, a guard slipped in and quietly undid the knot and allowed McCain to stretch out and left him there. Till very early the next morning, before other guards had arrived, he slipped back in and retightened and retied it. He would do this, giving McCain relief. McCain said that Christmas day, he encountered that guard on the grounds of the prison. Obviously not wanting to give any hint of recognition, though they encountered each other, they just stood there silent for a moment. And then McCain said, that guard looking at the ground reached out with his foot and in the dust, drew the sign of the cross. And they both stood and looked at that symbol till the guard erased it and they walked away. Don't tell me there's no power in a symbol. We come to a table that symbolizes the fact that God has made us his own in Christ. But because of that, we come to a table that says, now you, you, me, we reach out to create oneness in our world in Christ. And we do it in the simplest of ways. We open our door, put another setting at the table, and say, join us for dinner. So here's my live-out challenge for you. It's very simple. 
invite someone to your house this week, to your table. Open up your home, open up your heart, and do this ancient act of trust and intimacy. I love what the late Fred Craddock used to say. He used to say, tell me who sits at your table, and I'll tell you who you are. So I stood there on an island. What is wrong with you? I put that right in your breadbasket. Can't you hold on to anything? Isolated and alone. But I remember one other thing from that day. I remember it because I did it every day. When school ended, I trudged up the street, took a left a couple blocks away, a right one more block away, up over a little rise, and then down a long road, crossed a busy street, and then up into the home neighborhood and arrived at home. Did a few chores, did a little homework. And then mom said, supper time. And she called us all in. Dad said at that end. Mom said at this end. John sat right over there. Lindy sat there. Mary Ellen said here, and I said here, and I belonged because I was home. I think Jesus was at that table too. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to rejoice in the fact that he's made us one with God. And we're going to take seriously the implication to reach out and to become one with others. But you know, Mom did one other thing before we ate. She said, go wash up. So that's what we're going to do. Not just in honor of mom, but in honor of Jesus, who left us that example in John 13. We're going to go wash up by that act of humility and service called the foot washing in the educational wings. And I'm going to ask you, if you're a member of this community, keep your eyes open for a new person, a lonely person, a person on that island, and say, may I serve you? Come. And then we'll return to this place. And we'll sit down for supper. You won't want to miss it because the food is the best and the music is sublime. So go wash up.
causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble.
Good afternoon, church family. It's good to see you again. Today's scripture reading is from Luke 22, 14 to 20, and I'm reading from the New International Version. When the hour came, Jesus and his disciples reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until the fine until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let us pray. Our Father, as we partake in the Lord's Supper, we thank you for the sacrifice that you've made for us. We are so grateful that you sent your Son to die for us. As we partake in these emblems, the symbol of the wine as your blood spilt and the bread as your broken body. Please bless them. May our hearts be open to you. We pray for healing, we pray for forgiveness, and we pray a blessing on each and every one here. Amen.
A friend of mine says, if you get invited to the dining room table, you're a formal guest. But if you're part of the family, you eat at the kitchen table. So I think we're at Jesus' kitchen table. We're part of the family. And it is as a result of what we partake in here, his reconciling work between us and God, that we are now called to go live out reconciling work with brothers and sisters and others in our own lives. So that's what we enjoy, and that becomes our responsibility. So it was the Apostle Paul who said, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night he was betrayed, took bread, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, Take eat. After the same manner, Paul says, he took the cup and gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you.
us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Gracious God, as the hymn continues to echo in the air, as the flavor and the savor of the meal continues to linger on our lips, as your Holy Spirit continues to draw us to yourself, we open ourselves to reach out beyond ourselves and draw others in. Thank you for this supper table. And please lead us to many other supper tables where a slice of your kingdom becomes evident. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Warm greetings to all of you. I'm so glad to be with you with some more greetings. And listen up for dear friends, top of my list, Leela Reiki, Oakhurst, California, marking 90 years. Warmest congratulations to you, dear, and so glad to see you with your family there. Hello, Ken and Julie Narducci, right here, Riverside, California, marking your 40th wedding anniversary. Warmest congratulations as I see you earlier and now. All the best. Dear, dear Elaine Ellis, over Forest Lake, Florida way, hello Elaine, congratulations on your special birthday as I see you there with dear Albert, then your children and your grandchildren. I am so glad to be reminded of you, dear, dear friend. Hello, Pastor Claude Lavilla, right here nearby in Loma Linda, and I wish you a very happy 90th birthday as well, sir, as I see you there with your dear one. Hi, John McGee. Dear friend John to hundreds and hundreds of us, marks his 70th birthday, and you know how he's doing it? Yes, he's there with Denise, but he's also, every decade, walking the number of miles represented by his birthday. This year it's 70. Yes, there he is, joined by people who hurried him on. And at the last, his dear brother, Bill, Dr. Bill McGee, taking care of some pretty sore feet. Congratulations, John, on your 70th birthday. Opal Howard, Payette, Idaho. Hello, Opal. Yes, if folks just knew, we go back to grade school in Roseburg, Oregon. Congratulations on your birthday, Opal. And Ross Calkins, one of the best wearing pastors in all of Southern California at the same church for 31 years there at Bellflower. And there I get, get to see you someplace in the mountains with one of your members. Congratulations, Ross, on your birthday. And hello, hello, dear Salma Moore. Watch folks, this lady is 103 years old and this picture is recent Mother's Day. Warmest congratulations to you, dear Selma. Hello, Carolyn Rawson, now lives Surprise, Arizona way. And there she is with husband Bob and handsome sons, two of them. Congratulations, Carolyn, on your birthday. Hello, Barbara Bond Steiner, right here, a part of University Family. Haven't seen you for way too long and just pray everything is going well with you and dear Ernie. Hello, Irvin Thompson, Sonoma, California. 79th birthday, sir. Warmest congratulations to you. Glad to talk to you on the phone just the other day. And Melvin Johnson, Almsville, Oregon. 90th birthday, Melvin, but your voice is still wonderful. I heard you not too long ago with the Oregon Men's Chorus. Congratulations on your birthday. Hello, Margie and Jeffrey Rice up Ukiah, California way. 39th birthday. There they were, and there they are, and just look what 39 years produced. Congratulations, you two. Frank Howard, 66th birthday, Frank, and we're so, so grateful, right, as I see you there with dear, dear Marilyn. Congratulations on your birthday, Frank. Sharon Bennett, also one of my sisters here in University Church. Always glad to be with you and Jack, and now to congratulate you for your birthday, Sharon. Carol Ann Retzer, another one of my younger sisters marking a special birthday. And there she is with my dear colleague in ministry, Daryl Retzer. Congratulations, Carol Ann. Brian Hartnell, an important part of University Church. There he is, and there he is with four generations. His father, his son, and his first grandson there. And then just a while ago, it was son Jonathan's birthday, and we get to see Jonathan with his two sons. Warmest congratulations to the Hartnells. Hello, Bill Stone. Glad to see you there, standing beside dear Vienna, and your friends, the Bill Wilsons, and another one from Hinsdale days. Congratulations on your birthday, Bill. Hello, Dick Schaefer. 80th birthday, Dick. 
warmest congratulations and glad to see you there with your late brother. Congratulations. Claudine Robinson, Columbus, Ohio, I think it is now, and there you are in a picture with your kids a little while ago. Congratulations on your birthday, Claudine. And Ray, Eddie Reichman, right here in Loma Linda. So proud of you, Eddie. 38th birthday it is, and there with one of your best friends. Claudia Carmona Thomas, Dr. Thomas, right here, part of our Loma Linda family, one of our elders, and with her husband, Chris. Congratulations on your birthday, Claudia. Trace and Julia Salerno, now in Spokane, Washington. 16 years ago, there they were, and there they are with their darling three children. Congratulations on your anniversary, and congratulations, too, to your parents, Julia, Connie and Ben Gish, College Place, Washington, for their 40th anniversary, as we see them then and now. Eddie and Esther Norton, Boring, Oregon, Damascus, I guess it is, but congratulations on your 70th anniversary as I get to see you with daughter Carol. Rebecca O. Hello, Rebecca, your 12th birthday, honey. Congratulations, and I see you with sister Amelia. We're so proud of you, too. And Max Wood, now in Pasadumkig, Maine, 85th birthday man. Congratulations as I see you there with son who honored you on Father's Day just a few days ago. And Molly Weaver, now in Arkansas. And my classmates, Bob and Molly from Walla Walla Days. My favorite picture, them in their yellow 70-something Chevrolet convertible. And then Rosanna Savora, 51st birthday, I'm told. There she was, and there she is with husband. Jason Small, a part of Lomeland University family, 37th birthday with daughter and wife. Warm blessings to all of us for another week, and particularly now, as we get to see our trumpet quartet. Uh -huh.